Okay. So hi everyone. Um, I'm Emily from GoWP. If you don't already know me, uh, welcome to today's webinar with Greg Zakowitz from OmniSend on how to use omnichannel marketing to drive customer retention. Um, really quick, I just want to say a couple of words about GoWP in case anyone watching isn't familiar with us already. Uh, so at GoWP, we are a team that is devoted to helping agencies grow by providing exceptional outsourced WordPress services. Um, agencies that partner with GoWP are able to focus on the low touch, high value work that helps them grow because they can depend on GoWP to take care of the high touch, low value work that disrupts their day. Um, high touch, low value work, when we say that we're talking about things like website maintenance. So when you um, do all those plugin updates and something breaks, you have to go in there and fix it. It can take valuable time out of your day. Um, never ending content edit requests, those sorts of things coming in from your clients um, are some of our plans to help take care of that for agency owners so that they're able to focus on the more important things like growing their agency and closing deals and getting new projects. Um, I also want to say one thing about uh, creating a GoWP partner account. So Creating a GoWP partner account is absolutely free and it gets you access to all sorts of resources to grow your agency. Um, currently in our knowledge base, we have landing page templates to help you sell care plans, uh, a maintenance schedule lead magnet that you can take and um, edit and use as your own as, as long as well as a landing page template to help you generate leads and increase your recurring revenue. Um, all of those are free and they're all accessible through the GoWP client portal, which you get free access to by creating your account. Um, there's also all sorts of documentation you can take and make your own to use with your clients and prospects, like um, how to submit content edit requests, uh, what are the specs and prices of your plans, that sort of stuff. You can create your partner account at my.gowp.com um, and, and check out everything in there in our knowledge base. If you have any questions about partnering with GoWP and how we can help your agency, feel free to email me at emily at gowp.com or reach out to me here in the chat while we're out on the webinar and I'll, I'll uh, get in touch. I also wanna tell you about our Facebook group for those of you watching who may not be a member yet. It is the GoWP Niche Agency Owners Facebook group. Um, this is a community of agency professionals who either already serve a niche market or would like to niche down. We're broadcasting this webinar in the group there live now, and the recording's also available there to watch afterwards. So go check it out and request to join. If you haven't already, we'd love to have you. Um, a few notes about the webinar. I will be watching the chat both here in, um, in, the, Zoom, in the Zoom room and also over on Facebook. So if you have any questions about that, just throw them up in the chat and I'll get to them. Um, so no problem there. And We've already done a quick test of the chat uh, in, in Zoom, but if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and let me know. And I think we've already had some, but I've lost my place. So I'll, I'll check those and make sure that, that that's working there, but we should be live over there. Um, all right, so let's get to why we're here today. Lo um, <laughs> sorry, Greg Zakowitz. Greg is the director of content at OmniSend and has nearly 15 years of experience in email, mobile, and social media marketing. His retail subject matter expertise stems from his experience consulting retailers, including numerous internet retailer top 1000 clients with an in-depth analysis of their marketing programs. So Greg, it's great to have you here today. Thank you. Um, if you guys are part of the Facebook group, you know Lindsay and the, the two Johns that joined us last week during the happiness hour. So Greg is the OmniSend team member that we have not met yet. So welcome, Greg. Thanks, Emily. I'm uh, super happy to be here. And, and what are the odds of a, a company hiring two people named John that are spelled J-O-N versus J -O -N Both spelled J -O -N. Yeah. Yeah. So it, <laughs> yes. it threw some uh, wonky stuff with email addresses and things. So I, uh, Emily, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's all right. Perfect. Yeah, go for it. I'll go ahead and mute myself and I'll cool. pop in with any questions that come up. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your time today. I'm super happy to be here and excited to talk about customer retention because this is, I mean, one of those topics where you could spend hours talking about and have 20 different opinions and probably all of those opinions be right because everything really matters here. Uh, I'm not here to give you a big spiel about who OmniSend is. Obviously, if you were attending one of those sessions last week with the Johns or Lindsay, uh, you know, pretty familiar with us. Visit us at omnisend.com. Uh, obviously, we are a marketing platform built specifically for e-commerce businesses. So we're designed to 
increase your sales, not necessarily the workload. So we've got pre-built uh, templated visual marketing automations. We use multiple channels like email, SMS, push, Facebook, Google AdSense, 24 seven support, coming in the whole nine yards there. So uh, omnisend.com, check us out, fill it in over there. Uh, as Emily mentioned, uh, director of content, I'm also a resident marketing strategist for Omnisend as well, having plenty of experience consulting clients and serving as a marketing analyst. I'm also the host of our uh, podcast called The Cart Insiders. So we have season two dropping next week, which is all about holiday marketing. So if you haven't listened, uh, feel free to tune in there as well. But all that put aside, let's talk about customer retention. So here's the Greg, one thing with, yep. Well, sorry, we already had one question pop up. Man. <laughs> um, where, can, where can people find the replays of those webinars you, you just mentioned? Uh, the, so the ones I just mentioned were the, the GoWP ones. I'm assuming it was the chat. Oh, you might have yeah. Had, yeah, okay, yeah, so John. yeah those, yep. those are the happiness hours, which are there in the go. Facebook group. I'll put a link in the chat there for that. Awesome. For that right now. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. No problem. All right, and uh, I, I think the one thing with customer retention is that I, everyone knows this, right? Those old blocks or that old visual of kind of your step-by-step, -step, uh, you know, customer journey path that goes from, you know, kind of this discovery to engagement all the way to purchase. And then it just kind of loops around back to uh, engagement and then repeat purchase and loyalty. We all know those things are kind of outdated now. Consumers are shopping everywhere. It's not linear. It is pretty much, consumer is going to do what a consumer is going to do, and they're going to bounce around during different channels. And it's really the company's job to, to kind of facilitate and plug holes in that customer journey path, which is a lot easier said than done. So we take our best approach and we try to do the things that we can do in a scalable fashion that's going to have the most dividends here. And I think when we look at this, what that shifting path has caused is one from an email side, the ability for a lot of retailers to kind of not shift away from batch and blast messaging because there's more people signing up, there's more emails to get out and we know the ROI of it. And what happens is we kind of get this, this generic messaging that fails to cater to what consumers expect from brands. And it's kind of a double-edged sword because segmentation is one of those things where, yeah, it can be valuable, it can do it. It can also be really time consuming and, and difficult to do, especially if you are a one or two person shop where you can't create seven different versions of an email if you're sending three, four emails every single week, unless you have a big team. And the fact is most companies don't have big teams that dedicate the email. So what I'm here to, to today to show you are, here's some things that are going to really matter from a customer retention standpoint to increase your sales, but ultimately are scalable and actually executable, even if you are a one man sh uh, show. So we wanna get into this, but try to break away from that batch and blast messaging, make that less of a reliance for you and use more targeted, relevant, segmented messages in a very scalable fashion. Now, the reason why we want to do that is because one, that journey is no longer linear, but we've also shown that if we can touch consumers in multiple different places, the conversion is going to be that much better for us. So it's not about necessarily adding 20 more channels, right? We have to be on TikTok and we have to be on a paid search and we have to do all these different types of of advertisement, it's about finding the channels that really work well for you and your brand and your audience. And that's the most important part about it. But we do know that if we use multiple channels, it'll be more effective for us. Which brings us into the whole discussion of customer retention. And with customer retention, obviously we want to cre increase sales, but retention is not just about what happens after the purchase is made. A lot of it happens leading up to the purchase point, which is going to give you a better customer experience, a better shopping experience, which is going to have a huge impact on retention. And then obviously what comes after is going to be a, a huge factor as well. So I'm going to start from very basic kind of that quote unquote customer journey and figure out the basic small, I always say the small, simple things matter. Uh, small, simple things matter here. So let's talk about ways we can make our programs a little bit better all the way from first discovery, all the way to purchase and what we do after the purchase and leave you with some ideas there. So first of all, when we talk about different channels, I think this is the one channel where people might go, well, of course you guys send email or SMS, you're gonna talk about SMS. This really has a huge untapped potential, especially during the upcoming holiday season. This could be a retail gold mine this holiday season. Here's where SMS really becomes important. One, it can serve as a standalone channel, but it can also work as a complementary channel if you don't wanna make it a standalone uh, you know, marketing channel for yourself. And I'm going to show you exactly what that looks like and how easy it is to do more so from an automation standpoint. But this is one where we're consistently seeing increase in revenues and ways to 
cut through inbox noise, especially in the holiday season when those uh, inboxes will start to get more crowded. Here's the beauty of it. SMS is a trusted opt-in channel. And so we put out, we started putting out these quarterly benchmark reports, which are ungated. So you can jump over to omnisend.com, go to the resources section, and you'll see a Q2 stats report where we look at all the stats year over year from email, SMS, push messages, compare them. We look for trends. Uh, we also did one during the COVID-19 uh, kind of rise. And then right when we were in the meat of it, and you can see how email performance shifted during that time. One of the things we saw is that email along with SMS were these trusted channels. So when kind of stuff hit the fan, people were turning to emails for trusted content. They were looking for product discovery and they were absolutely skyrocketing with conversions here. This is the beauty of SMS. It's one of those opt-in channels. It's still underutilized, but increasingly being more utilized, which means that consumers are actually wanting it and they are responding to it. And when come the holiday season, when you know Black Friday or uh, Black Friday week, these high send periods, SMS is one of these great tools there. Now, the other thing is, you know, cost used to be a really big barrier for using SMS. And it's like, oh, I don't want to pay that much. It's really not a cost issue anymore. It is so cheap. And of course, I can always spend someone else's money, but it is really cheap to do so, right? And we can test it out. Now, OmniSend, we offer free SMS credits for uh, people on certain plans. So you can actually use it for free uh, based on what plan you are as well. But even so, super cheap. So that barrier is not there. It's really just a matter of collecting the uh, SMS subscribers and then doing something with it. So what I would encourage you to do is start collecting it. And even if you want to do it for the holidays, it is definitely not too late. Simple things to do. If you have a pop-up, add mobile uh, phone collection numbers to that pop-up. If you have an exit intent, add it there. If you start collecting up, promote it on your social accounts as well. And I'll show you some different things we can do with that, but start collecting. And what this is going to do, even if you're not ready to use it yet and you collect it, you're going to get a pretty good indication about whether your audience, one, wants to receive those messages, but two, how quickly they are saying, yeah, let me receive those messages. Because if you find really high adoption for it, then you know, hey, I went beyond to something here. And it reduces the reliance on uh, batch and blast and those promotional messages. And I'm going to walk through the entire presentation. I, I'm going to talk about dabbling some SMS in here and show you how beneficial it can be. Now, here's the beauty of SMS. One, it's super time sensitive. 90% of messages are read within the first three minutes. So it's beautiful. From that perspective, you take that out over five minutes. And I think that number goes up to maybe 97%, somewhere in there. Because it's read so quickly, it serves a purpose where emails not, might not be able to. So think about these last chance reminders. So if your shopping cart's about to expire, that discount or the cart itself is going to expire contents, uh, you can send the message out because you know people will see it. You can run flash sales or Black Friday, Cyber Monday promotions. If it's a peak holiday season, you know that, hey, I can send it. Hey, two hours left in the sale. The consumer might not get the email. You know, they'll get the SMS. So you can even run standalone promotions such as flash sales during this time period. You, it's great for a sense of urgency. If you know items are selling out fast, you can use that sense of urgency. Hey, two hours left or get it before it's gone. Items selling out fast. It's immediate. You can get them to go from there as well. And then obviously we can uh, dab it into your automated messages, reminders, which I'll talk about as well. It's also great as a complimentary channel, right? We can drive people to the emails you send if you want to as well. So if you don't want to send promo codes or whatever out in the SMS, you can say, hey, check out our, uh, check out our email for the, the most recent sales. Or if you have a lot of things you want to convey within the email itself, messaging, product recommendations, whatever it might be, send people an SMS and have them jump over there. So you know, it could even be something like, hey, sales going to start in 30 minutes don't miss our email for promo code or whatever it might be. So we can actually do some things to make people excited about offers. You can certainly create exclusivity with your email program, or I'm sorry, your SMS program, do it with your email as well, but think about SMS only discounts, right? So especially during the season. So this is a sign up to call it, Hey, sign up for an SMS program and receive SMS only discounts, whatever it might be. Maybe it's an extra discount on top of the email. So you don't want to throw your email under the bus. Uh, but you can maybe start sales or uh, flash sales just for these subscribers as well. So have a lot of different options for what you can do with SMS. Small, simple, scalable, easy to execute things can really go a long way. Now, MMS, is, unlike SMS, where SMS is text-based and obviously links in there, MMS is where you can put images in the messages. So you can use that in combination with SMS messages as well. 
Do you have to do it in every single message? Probably not. And I probably wouldn't recommend doing it, but think about those areas where MMS can uh, be a complimentary tool to SMS. So maybe you do have a visual that you want to show to people. It's a new product or you're having a promotion where they get a free gift and you want to highlight that. Super great there. If you have a promo code you want people to easily remember and recognize, you can have an image just with that promo code. You know, 20% off, 20 off now, whatever it might be. And people will remember the images a lot more than the text makes an easy way to kind of jump in there. So look for areas to use MMS. Again, I wouldn't do it with every send, but if you have something where the visual is really going to be compelling, then do it. And then finally, workflows, combination of transactionals. I'm going to showcase a couple workflows and as briefly talk about how to incorporate SMS to make it another selling point within that automated workflow. But think about where the, your transactional message is. And certainly the transactional really applies to customer retention here because it helps improve that customer journey and that, that purchase experience. So if I make a purchase, you think about the holidays, which are coming up now where we just don't know what's going to happen with shipping. Everyone's saying there's going to be the hu these huge delays might maybe maybe not but it's great to know that in a time where we're not sure what's going to happen you can get an sms and say hey greg your product shipped or it's going to be delivered tomorrow that really just makes the purchase experience so much better and from the customer they remember those things and, and these are small again those small simple things that matter for customers the transparency can go can mean wonders for them it can go a really long way for them and then obviously we can incorporate other channels into that as well if we want to. So email, send it, you know, if they don't open a message, but they're on the SMS subscriber list, we can then send them just to make sure they didn't miss that email, whatever it might be. Now, of course, we have a lot of clients who are sending SMS messages. Uh, one that we've documented, uh, you know, 15% of their promotional revenue. So if you think about the emails and all the other channels they're using, 15% 15, 15 of their promotional revenue is just on SMS alone. So this is where the, really where the benefit comes up. You'll never know how it's going to work for you unless you try it. And again, the beauty here is it doesn't cost anything to collect the numbers. Even if you collect them and never use them, that's fine, right? You're not promising anything, but certainly go ahead and collect them. So SMS is going to be a gold mine for a lot of retailers, especially in the holiday season. So be sure to use it wherever you can, but certainly look into using that. All right, so let's say we've collected email subscribers, we collected maybe even SMS subscribers at the same time, hopefully you are. This comes in the welcome messaging. You might go, well, welcome messaging, what does this have to do with customer retention? Well, it has a lot to do with driving sales and that's really uh, what we are talking about here. Can't have retention unless you have the initial sale. So if we look at that Q2 stats report we put out, by the way, Q3 will be coming out shortly. Uh, you know, if we look at all the conversions across all the emails and it was over, you know, two and a half billion emails sent, almost 10% of email conversions came from the welcome message alone. Conversion rate close to 50%. Now, this is insanely high. I had to go back and double and triple check the numbers, make sure I wasn't running calculations wrong uh, and everything. And sure enough, I had them re-pull re the numbers out of the system as well. 50% conversion rates during Q2 on the welcome message alone. Now, COVID certainly played an impact in there, but you think about people who sign up for email programs. Some of you are probably in this boat as well. You sign up and you're hoping for a discount in there. Don't always need one, but these messages are important for driving that initial conversion. So what we wanna do is we wanna to try to optimize the message. Now I show this stat here about uh, personalization now being a standard service. This is a couple years old, this stat. And I always tell people, and I'll probably say it again in a few slides here that Things have not changed in the last couple of years. They just expect it even more and more and more now. So what we want to do is we want to take personalization that consumers expect. We want to kind of combine segmentation with that because at the end of the day, that's what personalization is. It's finding uh, a specific way to talk to someone and segmentation is usually a way to do that. And we want to marry them in a very cohesive and simple and easy to execute fashion. So let's look at a traditional welcome series. And here's one that kind of checks all those best practices that you hear about from an email standpoint. Welcome them to the list, give them a call to action. If you have a rewards program, introduce it. You wanna send that managed preference message. So, hey, tell us more about you. Why do retailers send that? Well, they wanna learn more about them so they can segment different messages to them. And then the obligatory connect with us on social media because of course consumers have no idea you're on social media unless you tell them. But this checks every best practice you will read and hear about from a welcome series standpoint. But here's the problem. If I'm an 18 year old female or a 32 year old male and I get these messaging, there's no way it's relevant to both of us at the same time. There are so many different things that we are doing here. 
you know, and I can collect information on the managed preferences. I know what you're interested in without you telling me. And it's about using that data in a very simple and cohesive fashion. So how do we do this? Well, let's think about the actual subscriber. So if we have a sign up and we have a way to segment our audience, maybe based on male, female is a really good example. It's kind of clear cut. You're either male or you're either female. Uh, you know, and you're shopping for one of these two sets of products. Now it could be that you're shopping for both for a significant other, but for the most part, you're going to want emails around your own interests. So if you have the ability to collect this in some fashion, just ask for it right on a form, what you're most interested in, we have a simple set of segmentation data we can use immediately to make more message, uh, more relevant messaging here for you. So we say, okay, we collect, we click, women, we enter our email address, hopefully SMS at the same time as well. And we get this message here that is just showcasing women's shoes versus men's style of shoes. Now you can see we're not recreating the wheel here. We're not doing anything that is making your mind just blow out of this universe, right? One piece of simple data that we can use to really convey the same messaging, but we just change the image. Now think about, we can take this a step further and say, okay, how do we really customize that message there? And we can do so. And you can go as deep as you want or as high level as you want. You can also base your entire welcome series off of this. So we know that they're coming in under mail. Okay, let's highlight some mail shoes in message two, as opposed to saying, tell us what you're interested in. We're gonna showcase maybe the top rated men's products or customer favorites or the new styles for the season, right? We could start leaning them that way. And then we can maybe integrate social proof with other uh, males who are sharing images on social media. So we're incorporating things in a slightly different way that's more relevant there. And you do the same thing for the female side. So simply asking for a simple piece of data uh, that you can use to customize these can be really powerful. Now it doesn't have to be male, female, right? It could be business or personal, right? So if you are sending, uh, say, gift baskets where you have personal purchases and corporate purchases, right? We can do that, but think about what might matter for you and how you might be able to, to segment in a very simple one, two, three, or four different ways. Now, the other way to do is to actually capture where they are signing up from. So based on your e-com platform, we obviously have deep integrations with uh, multiple e-com platforms, Shopify, Shopify Plus, you know, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, things like that. But uh, based on the structure and how your, uh, your URLs are structured on that site, what you can do is you can deploy different pop-ups on different categories of your website. So if we say, okay, we have an identical pop-up that shows when someone is on the women's jumpsuit section of the site versus someone who's viewing uh, men's t-shirts. Identical site, we don't ask them for information, but we have a tag in that pop-up that says, hey, when they submit this, tag them as signing up from men's t-shirts or men's shirts or men's, whatever it might be. Now they have no way of knowing, they didn't submit anything, they don't know anything, but in the back end, you have now determined which category of the website they were browsing when they said, yep, I wanna receive your emails. It's just an indication about their intent, at least their happiness with your brand up until that point. And what we can do is we can say, okay, customer comes in, we'll trigger our automated message, our welcome message or welcome series. We know they came in viewing a women's jumpsuit section. We know there's some sort of intent, they're on women's jumpsuit section of our website. So let's deliver them a different message. And again, it could be the same thing. It could be a little more targeted, but we're just gonna reinforce what they were looking at from the first time. Same for the men's, right? I don't care about jumpsuits. I probably care about soft, comfy tees because that's what I like to wear. Uh, so we have a lot of different options for how to make these messages more relevant to make that purchase experience or the customer shopping experience more relevant, more friendly, a better, more improved over our competition which can go a long way to retention. Now, another thing you can do if you wanna build out that series and really drive someone to point of purchase is think about even if you have a generic welcome message sending, same message goes to everyone. Think about the navigation bar. Those are typically your high category products, high traffic products, right? So if you send the generic welcome message to me and to three other people and we all click on different links in, the well, in that navigation bar, you can have automation that says, okay, did this person click on this link? Let's send them the next message, which is targeted around that category of products or customer favorites or top rated in that category. And we could just split them that way. And it's very easy. And you let them dictate what they're interested in. And if you think about the experience at that point, they've gone to your website, they've qualified you, they've signed up, hopefully you're for SMS as well. They've opened your welcome message, probably looking for a discount code, but maybe something else. They're still interested, but they click on a specific navigation link. 
right? There's a lot of intent there for that consumer. Goal is to capture that intent driving the purchase. Now we did have a, we had a, a customer who did just this with a navigation bar, right? And they said, okay, generic welcome message everyone, but they had a couple high level categories and they tested with one. They click on this link, they get this message, more sales oriented, less fluffy than, hey, this is why you should shop with us. Increase in every metric, open, click, conversion rates, revenue per email, compared to the generic welcome message, not promotional message, just welcome message, almost 8,000 times better. And out of that welcome message, they sent 3% of the volume versus the generic version, 140% more revenue. They drove more revenue and less messages. And that's the name of the game, right? We wanna get that person the conversion so we can really focus on that retention. So this is where it's all about. And then we just add in trusted channels. So they've opted in, they've had an SMS. We said maybe a cut a message or two out of that welcome series or we send them a reminder via SMS. And now we're engaging them across multiple channels. We're keeping them interested in our brand. We're keeping our brand in front and center to them. We're delivering relevant information, which is ultimately going to lead, as we saw from the stats earlier, to more conversions here as well. So it's all about personalizing, but ideally we personalize with very small pieces of information and in a very automated fashion. Less work on your side, right? Most of this content you probably have already, but we're gonna increase revenue from it. All right, and now we wanna drive them further. So, okay, great, we got the signups, we, we're engaging with them. Now we wanna talk about abandonment. There's two different types of abandonment I wanna talk about because this is all about driving again to conversion where we can then focus on some post-purchase activity with them. So here's a stat from 2016. This is almost five years old now. 62% of consumers expect emails to be personalized based on what they looked at on the website. There is no reason to believe people do not think this even more so. So with browse abandonment or product abandonment, it's still an underutilized tactic, but you've probably seen it yourself. A lot more retailers are adopting this because it's just a lot easier to implement now, but they know it works. It's the, it's the perfect identification or the definition of right message, right time, right consumer, right channel, right? They're viewing a specific category or a very specific product, but they haven't carded. We know there's intent there. Let's capitalize on that intent. So again, from our stats report, you look at the raw numbers for product and browse abandonment. So the difference between these two, if you don't know, browse abandonment is more looking, if you think about like category pers uh, perspective. Hey, Greg was on my site and he was checking out sneakers. You know, yeah, I'm not looking at specific sneakers, but we can just trigger it based on that. Or Greg was on this website and he was looking at this very specific set of a uh, pair of sneakers or a very specific product and then we can trigger off based on that actual product. The really the control is up to the user, so your standpoint, but we can see open rates high, click rates high, conversion rates high. In fact, the 51% open rate for product abandonment was the best performing open rate message out of any message sent out of the OmniSend platform in uh, Q2 as well. So take that for what it's worth. So again, here's where we're looking at different things, right? So how do we set this up? Well, regardless of how you choose, think about high traffic products or high margin products or uh, holiday season. If you do it for the holidays to test out, think about those holiday specific ones that we can have it automate on there. Your rules, think about much like card abandonment, it's, you know, which I'll talk about in a minute, but think about the timing rules there. We wanna capitalize upon people's intent as quick as we can to capitalize upon that. So how do we do that? Well, maybe it's 12 hours, six hours, one day later that we send this automated message out. Now there's a lot of different strategies. I've given 45 minute presentations on uh, browse abandonment alone. So there's a lot to cover. I'm not gonna get into all that obviously, but you've probably gotten messages that you maybe knew were uh, abandonment messages and maybe those you did not. So in this case, you can see the Roan example here. You know, you forgot to add these to your cart. So it's very specific where if I get this message and I open it, I know that they were tracking me on the website. I know it's not really intrusive to me. I like these messages, but it's not intrusive because it's helping me along my journey. Now, you don't have to come right out and say, hey, Greg, we noticed you checking out some stuff on our website and you haven't bought it yet. You can make it look very much like a promotional message you might send on an everyday Tuesday. All the consumer knows at that point is it's a relevant message based on something they were looking at, right? So we think about these opportunities where we can, yes, say exactly what we want to say and say, yep, we saw you checking us out. Here's some reasons to shop with us, but also we can just kind of keep it more generic, make it look like a batch and blast message, but it's only going to the relevant people. Now think about the content in these messages as well. We do want to get them across the finish line. Let's use a sense of urgency. Hey, these are, these are customer favorites. They don't last long. 
use that sense of urgency where we can, especially during the holidays. But also think about reinforcing value adds here too. So what's gonna to matter to consumers? Maybe fast and free shipping, maybe it's free exchanges and returns, uh, maybe it's extended return policies, maybe it's 24 seven support, free gift wrapping, free gift with purchase, whatever it is, what's going to matter for consumers? You can highlight those here because you know that we wanna push them over that conversion, make them feel comfortable to make that purchase and move on from there. And then finally, again, we can add SMS to this. We can layer this on. It's a trusted channel with this. Of course, not everyone's going to get it. Only your SMS subscribers are going to get it, but that's okay because we know they opted into it. And this is where we can uh, just automate this again. Right time, right customer, right message, right channel. And this is where we can really make the tools go to work for us. So here's one of our customers uh, who did just this. We can see from the message uh, metrics, 47% open rate, which is pretty typical to the 51 we showed before, lift in revenue per email. I mean, almost 2000 times better. Here's the big thing I look at, right? How much of your yearly revenue can you drive with automated messages? And ideally we wanna shoot for 30 to 40% of your email marketing revenue coming from automated messages. One, it decreases your reliance on batch and blast messaging. But two, you're making money when you sleep and there is nothing better with making money when you sleep. So this client, 12% of yearly revenue, are just a set of messages. And if you factor in some of those other high revenue ones, works out really well for them. So hopefully we send messages like that. We get people to cart products and we are so close to getting the purchase now and so close to talking about post-purchase message. Act surprised when I talk about post-purchase. Cart abandonment, most likely the most profitable message you will ever send from your email program. And we all know the reason why. They put stuff in their cart. We know what they're looking for. Holiday season will be the most profitable, but slightly different. We have a lot of wish listing going on or compiling things and items selling out fast, but they're still carting stuff. They're still interested in your brand. So with all the emails sent during Q2, looking at that stats report again, just to kind of give you guys some perspective here, again, 11% of all email conversions, two and a half billion emails, all email conversions, cart abandonment. It's the number one killer, right? Uh, we have a client where 15% of their yearly email revenue on less than 1% of their email sends with cart abandonment. I mean, these are, these, are, these are high profitable messages. So how do we use them more advantageously? Well, we want to take great messages like these. We want to make them better. And we're going to do so by optimizing some of those small, uh, small variables or small tasks like you would with uh, product or browse abandonment as well. So let's think about timing. Let's think about number of messages. So timing. When are people abandoning their shopping carts? Well, we know they're into something. Now, this is the debate. Do we send it one hour uh, or two hours later? Do we send it at 12 hours or 24 hours later? And then three days, four days, five days, six days, seven days, whatever it might be. Well, it's gonna depend one on season. Holiday season, I would send it sooner than later. Shorten that window, especially if you have a five day window there, make it maybe three days, right? We wanna strike while the iron's hot. Now, if there are different variables, which I'll talk about in a minute, do you always need to do that? Probably not. During a, say, March, when it's maybe not your busiest season, yeah, maybe you want to give people more time to think about or research or do things like this. But we do want to strike while the iron's hot. First message, I would definitely send one to two hours after abandonment. Try to get in there. Uh, I would try to avoid, like, oops, you left something in your cart. No one's leaving it by accident anymore. They're doing it because they're either price shopping or uh, they're homeschooling like I do with my kids now and they've got to get pulled away or they have a meeting or something, whatever it might be. Not that I shop during work, but you get the gist. Uh, but let's, you know, we, we look at things like this and say, okay, how do we get them back? And then 24 hours later, I would have the second message go, but certainly test this out. It's going to vary based on your price point, the products you sell, the decision cycles, the research cycles, all that. Now, number of messages will certainly dictate your timing here. So typical best practices will tell you, hey, send three messages, one hour, 24 hours, three, four, five days, whatever it might be. There is no law saying you can only send three messages. I've had clients in the past send four or five. Some do it only for the holiday season. Some have only done it for the holiday season. It works so well, they've done it the rest of the year. Base it on your products. Do you need to send five messages to someone who abandoned a $15 pair of cheap headphones in your shopping cart? Probably not. Right, but we can factor those things into this. Now, if you're shortening the timing for the holiday season, you might wanna add a fourth or fifth message that maybe cover that entire length of time that you were doing before. So the fifth or sixth message, really important in this case. So there's no right or wrong here. I would definitely have it at least three going, 
again, based on price point, things like this, but change your messaging, make it more relevant, overcome those obstacles to conversion, like shipping costs or uh, customer sort, uh, service or free returns and exchanges. Overcome those in your messaging and you could do that. When it comes to incentives, think about what your incentive strategy is, right? Are we offering something? Are we not offering something? Are we offering something only in a third message? I, there's no right or wrong here. I would say do what with, is within your comfort level. If it's not the holiday season where you're usually discounting left and right anyways, you know, you might want to hold it off to the second or third message to try to, but really use the sense of urgency before that to drive a sale. If it's the holiday season and you're offering 30% off anyways, you might as well just put it in the first message and try to capture them because they're going to use the a promo code somewhere. Uh, just for the holidays though, if you normally offer 10% off and you know you're having 30% site wide, that 10% doesn't matter. Either change your messaging, update it to 30%, give them a new promo code, or reinforce some of those other value adds. When it comes to SMS, again, same thing. We want to add in those trusted channels. We want to change the delivery meth method. And we can say, okay, we're going to expire your cart. Let's send you an SMS message because I know you're going to read the message in a very short period of time. I know I can get you right there only. Uh, you can offer SMS only offers for cart abandonment specifically. You can use last chance reminders, say products won't last long. You know, these are customer favorites. Again, a lot of different things you can do. And again, this factors into timing and number of messages. So if you're okay with three messages over X period of days, that might be fine. But maybe for your SMS people, instead of giving them four or five emails, they get the fourth message via SMS. And then you kind of let it die from that point. So a lot of different tools you can do to test out, play with these variables. But if they're off, opting in the SMS, use SMS. And then finally, look at the actual cart total or the purchasers. I mentioned a minute ago, do you need to send five messages for a $15 you know, abandoned cart? Yeah, probably not. But we can fat, uh, filter and, and factor these into our, our, uh, our automation. So think about, hey, they abandoned the shopping cart. All right, I know that I have a $100 uh, free shipping threshold on my website. So under $100, I know that I have someone there that I say, okay, I can promote, hey, get over $100, you get free shipping. I can even factor my discount based on the car total. So, hey, spend over 100, 120, get XYZ off and qualify for free shipping. All right, so we know we're trying to increase the basket size to qualify for the free shipping, but also take it up a little bit more so they have to raise that car total just to use the discount. If it's really low, you know, maybe you just want to try to promote some other differentiators or recommend some other products. If it's well above that, think about the, the obstacles to conversion at that point. You don't need to say, hey, if we offer free shipping on over $100 if they have a $300 cart. What's going to matter to them at that point? Could be return and exchange policies. It could be uh, uh, scarcity, right? They just, it's a lot harder to pay 300 bucks than 100 bucks. So how do we overcome those obstacles within our messaging? Maybe it's to talk to a support agent or to reinforce that, you know, satisfaction guaranteed, whatever it might be, and we can do that. We could do the same thing with the purchaser itself. So we talk about customer retention here and we're saying, okay, we know that the person who abandoned this cart has never purchased from us before. This is our gold mine to try to get them to purchase the first thing to factor in that retention. So do we wanna bribe them a little extra more? Do we wanna bribe them and reinforce every value ahead under the sun knowing they've never purchased? Versus the person who is maybe a first time purchaser coming back and now debating that second time purchase. And we all know getting that second purchase is gonna provide huge value from a profit standpoint from the customer and the company. Or are they a loyal customer? Because maybe we wanna change our message and just thank them for being a loyal customer, but we know we don't have to discount them quite as much. So we can factor these things into the automation and play it from there and make the messaging, again, automated, segmented, more relevant, but improves the shopping experience as well. And this is what it's all about. And I mentioned before, 15% of revenue and less than 1% of email sends from a client. This is not an atypical number. This is pretty common for what you'll see, 10 to 15% of revenue from an email program driven off card abandonment messages. Some clients have a little bit more, some a little bit less, but these are high profitable messages. Maximize them to your best ability. All right, so we have finally driven people from acquisition, to SMS, through welcome messaging, to relevant messaging, browse abandonment, card abandonment. We have delivered an outstanding, relevant, personalized customer journey up until this point, and we got them to convert. 
and it was probably the SMS that did. No, I'm just joking. We got them to convert. Now, what do we do with them? Because this is where a lot of companies fall off. And when I used to do consulting and I would talk to a company the first time and I'd say, okay, what are some of your priorities? And you know, the priority is always, how do we increase our customer retention? Do you have any ideas how to do that? Well, we want to do some laps, laps purchaser campaigns because, you know, because they purchased from us before. So we know we can get them back, but we'll wait on the post purchase for now. And I always say, well, you're, you're, you're doing this backwards and here's why. Because when you're targeting lapsed purchasers, they have already lapsed. It doesn't mean they won't come back. It doesn't mean we can't bribe them to come back, but they have already churned, whatever that definition of churn is. Post-purchase are the ones who have just made a purchase from you. These are the ones you want to cultivate because they're going to be more profitable than your lap star. You're always going to be playing catch up and you're always going to be trying to get someone to come back versus pr cutting that off, cutting the snake off at the head, right? So the, this is probably one of the most underutilized tactics from an email standpoint yet it can be one of the most profitable ones as well. And here's what we want to look at. We want to make that purchase experience better, but most retailers will say, okay, well, I sent order transact, I sent order and shipping confirmations. I send them a product review message. What else do I need, right? We say thank you and those things. That does not make the purchase experience better. Maybe the order and shipping confirmations do, but the rest of it doesn't. Then you're just sending them batch and blast messages again, hoping they come back, but it's going to be on a whim. It's going to be completely happenstance. We want to control that a little bit more. Again, stats, think about this, you know, 25% open rates on post-purchase messaging. And these are targeted post-purchase messages, high click rates, high conversion rates. Every conversion here is at least a one-time repeat purchaser. This is the beauty of it. Holiday season's coming up huge, right? Because we know people are going to be shopping fast, going to be shopping off and shopping furiously, right? These are really important things here where if we can get one conversion, on a post-purchase message, they were at least a two-time customer. And then we just start the cycle and we start really hitting them home with what we wanna hit them home. So there are so many things you could do from post-purchase. Wouldn't shock you to tell you that I uh, have spoken for an hour long on post-purchase messaging and still haven't covered it. So there's so much to, to get through. I will try to provide you some high level overviews about ways to think through developing your own post-purchase uh, content. The beauty here is that Chances are the content you're going to need, 90% of it from a post-purchase standpoint, you probably already have. It's just about finding the content and utilizing it in the right way. So I always ask the question, this is especially true with restaurants, but if someone buys something from you and they don't share it on social media, did it happen? And that's kind of the state we're in. If I go to a restaurant and I don't tell anyone, take pictures of my pictures and tell anyone I'm there, it's like, it's like that restaurant never existed. We want people to share. We want people to be our marketing channel for us. We want them to not be customers. We want them to be advocates and loyalists with us. So if you put yourself in the mindset of, okay, I'm a customer, what is going to make me want to share my experience with others? That's the best way to start approaching your post-purchase post experience. Now, some of this is going to depend on the age of your audience. We get that, right? 16 year old girls, they're probably slapping stuff up on Instagram and uh, TikTok like there's no tomorrow. 60 year old guys, probably not quite doing as much of that, right? So we got to figure out post-purchase messaging that's going to matter to that individual consumer. Chances are most of these things will um, convey over for you. It's all about enhancing the purchase experience and engaging the customer. It's not about sending messages to get them to buy more. Of course, we want to do that. Of course, we're going to suggest that. But if it's not enhancing the experience, it's not a valuable message. So think about what's going to make them share their experience, whether it's on social or with friends verbally. That's what it's about. Here's a great example. I always tell people to look outside your own industry because sometimes they have the best examples to learn from. And, and uh, I don't even know when it was, maybe two years ago now, took a trip with my family to Legoland down in Florida. Stayed at the Legoland Hotel. It was a wonderful trip. The kids went crazy for it. And here's a couple messages I got from them before, you know, when I booked before getting me excited about it, giving me tips, and then, you know, asking me to write a review. And these were timely messages. They were set, you know, at certain weeks apart. Hey, you're coming, you know, two weeks away. Here's some cool stuff to do, some tips and tricks. Now, the great thing about these messages with, if you're looking at them right now, you would have no way of knowing that. If you ever go to the Legoland Hotel, their rooms in the hotel are all themed. And you can choose whether it's a pirate theme or a Disney theme. And then, of course, the entire room from wallpaper is all decked out. There are Legos in there that match that theme. We picked a pirate theme, right? Two boys made a lot of sense for us. So these are all pirate-themed emails. 
small, simple things. Now, here's the benefit of these. They're all helpful. So if you're selling products and not necessarily vacations or destinations, how do you make your messaging more helpful? How do you provide value ads? Well, there's a lot of different things. One, incentives can be helpful to come back to purchase again. Maybe incentives for add-on accessory items. Definitely more sales-oriented, so you just have to be mindful about how you position that. But simply saying thanks, sending a message that says, hey, thanks for your recent purchase. If there's anything we can ever do for you, don't hesitate to contact us, and here's how. And you have a call to action that maybe takes them to a blog or a customer service page or something along those lines where all you're doing is thanking them. Might also be a nice place where you can balance the incentive there. Saying thanks, you say same messaging. By the way, if you forgot something, here's 10% off or 50% off for your next purchase. If you are selling something that has how-tos or you need explanation for a better tool or feature adoption, send messages, right? So send a pair of shoes and maybe it's suede or whatever, boots, and we wanna to talk to you about waterproofing them. And obviously, clear cross-sell there. Here's how to wa uh, waterproof them. Uh, how to wash things appropriately. You know, I got one from, uh, I think it was Adore Me, which is, um, you know, a uh, subscription lingerie company. They sell pajamas and all those things there. But they sent an email one time about, I uh, bought my wife some pajamas, but how to properly wash your lingerie. Now, it wasn't necessarily relevant to the pajamas, but that is a great message, right? Because we're talking about how to care for the product. You could sell a $2 piece of junk that's going to break in one week. But if you send the message out to them that says, here's how to care for your product, it builds in a natural, uh, one, a, a natural, sense of, yeah, they want, they care about the product, but it establishes the quality a little bit more and it makes the, the user feel comfortable, the consumer feel comfortable shopping with you because they know you care about it. So these product cares or these how-to type emails, super helpful. So think about all those things. Obviously, share images on social media. Hey, share your products, share your usage, share, share something, tag us, start a hashtag around that, but let that uh, content start filling in your social media pages. You can then use that content for social proof in communications and other things as long as you get approval from them. Uh, so make that part of the rules or just ask them, but start filling those content. Social proof is such a huge thing now, but we can do all these things together. And of course, ratings and reviews for the actual product themselves. You can certainly filter these messaging messages into your nurturing message, post-purchase messaging, messaging as well. And again, they use product and reviews we can use that in welcome messages for top rated products or promotional messages or abandonment messages. These things are all cyclical. We can use one piece everywhere else we want to do so. And of course, when it comes to nurturing, you're not going to send the same post purchase message to every single consumer. So this is the ability of use your automation for you. Are they a first time customer? Great. Let's send them this series. Second time customer. Great. Send them this series. Loyal customer. Great. Maybe we just want one thank you message going out to them. And every couple of messages, we'll give them a discount. And of course, if they use SMS, we rope SMS into that nurturing as well because it's an easy way to do so. So here's a great example of how we can do that from an SMS standpoint. I talked about from those transactionals, hey, order just shipped. By the way, as a thank you, here's XYZ. There's clarity on the order. They know they're excited about your brand. They're excited about the product. Makes everything so much better. It's all about nurturing that environment. Here's a great example of a thank you message, but again, Here's a, a one company open rate on messages like this. Thanks for a recent order. Just thanking them. You know, better open rates, better conversion rates. And again, every conversion is another purchase. It's part of that retention strategy. And of course, revenue per email is insanely high for things like this. So don't, don't underestimate the power of saying thank you and being helpful to customers because that is, those are the things that matter. Those are what people are going to remember. They're going to talk about great customer service and poor customer service. And if you're stuck somewhere in the middle, you're just, you're blah. You're somewhere along with everyone else and there's no reason for them to shop with you again. Now, maybe they will, maybe they won't, maybe they'll keep coming back, but it's going to be sporadic. You know, don't be at the bottom end, be at the top end of the spectrum. That's how you're going to succeed here. So enhancing that journey is what it's all about. And every single thing I showed you today was about enhancing the journey here. So think beyond single channels, but it does not mean you need to use every channel. Sure, push, push messages can be beneficial from a, say, card abandonment standpoint. Do you need to use them? Not always, no. So think about what's gonna matter most for you, your brand, your consumers. Think about SMS and email as trusted opt-in channels where cost is no longer a barrier for success. So begin playing with it, at least exploring the options and see if it fits for you. All day, every day, 
doesn't matter what is happening in the world, relevance of your messaging will fight email, SMS, push, paid social, whatever. It's gonna fight fatigue. Relevance is all that matters to the consumer. Is the message helpful for me at that particular time? If yes, you've done a good job. And it's all about focusing on the customer journey. Can we help the customer journey? If the answer is yes, it's a good message. If it's no, eh, revisit the message and see what, what works. So obviously you can see here tons of resources on omnisend.com. We have the resources section from the uh, stats reports to white papers and books like this must have workflows for retailers, right? Just uh, if you have questions, explore the website. Here is my direct email address. You can always email me. I'm an open book. I'll be happy to uh, guide you along the path or set you up in the right direction. And again, increase your sales and not your workload. And that's really what it's about. So scalable, repeatable, effective tools, and we're good to go there. So hopefully you got something. I'm going to turn it back over to Emily in case we have any questions come in the chat there. Uh, but feel free to uh, jump on in, Emily. Awesome. That was so great, Greg. Thank you so much. I was like laughing out loud here in my office by myself. <laughs> you did an awesome job presenting everything. I mean, the information was fantastic. So thank you so much for that. Um, we did not get a lot of questions, but we can hold on and let people um, uh, add some in as we as we finish up here. Yep, Michael says, brilliant, lots of great information. Um, so, just, oh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if you had a question or whatever, I don't know if you have housekeeping. One thing that I always advise people, because right, if we don't have, if someone's listening to it and they don't have, say, many of these programs or even any of these programs already set up, the question ultimately becomes in, well, where do I start? Right. And it's a great question. Start with the most simple, the simplistic things that are going to drive the most revenue and automation. And those, I would say, welcome message. Absolutely, because it's you don't need the series, but start with that first message and card abandonment. Those are the two I'd start with. And again, even if you get one card abandonment message going, right, you can have that working for you, building up stats, and then you can just add another another message as you go and another message as you go. But make sure that welcome is there because people are going to be looking. You saw the conversion rate before. Like a lot of people are looking for that discount in there, but initial set, trend setting and then card abandonment, most profitable. So work on those. Do one thing at a time is the biggest thing. If you get 20% of 20 things done, you are nowhere near where you need to be. Focus on one thing, execute it, implement it, move on to the next one. And it, you'll be gathering data on the back end. So I want to throw that out there because that's always, ah, it sounds great, but it's a lot to do. Right? And it doesn't have to be a lot to do. Right. And there's so, there's so many options, but I think that's the case when, whenever you're getting started on automation, just, you know, get something set up, get some baseline information in there and then build it out as, as you grow. Um, we did have one question, a question just come in from Robert. What if your CTA is subscribed to a newsletter? Any best practices for that? I would say, uh, you know, it's probably all stuff that you have heard before. Like, Hey, tell them why, they should sign up for your newsletter or whatever. I think when it comes down to it, there are, you know, you'll hear things like, oh, you should use this color because it resonates better or this type of verbiage for subscribe to the newsletter, you know, or versus, you know, sign me up or something like that. I think a lot of those, a lot of, in a lot of cases, I can't talk today. It's great. Uh, in a lot of cases, those things are, tend to be overblown. If you're providing value to the recipient and they recognize that value, make the call to action what you want them to do. Sign up for the newsletter or sign up for, uh, you know, industry insights or best practice, whatever it might be. But I wouldn't overthink that one. As long as the messaging is relevant to them and you're conveying what you need to convey before the call to action, you'll keep them moving through. Now, you might have a little more success with certain verbiage points in there, but I don't think you're going to go from getting a 5% conversion to a 25% conversion just because you're changing the verbiage might see a little uptick, but you're not going to be, you know, it's not going to be a swing for the fences type of thing. You know, I always tell people and I tell, I, we sit, we talk about it internally with different projects we do at OmniSend. I'm like, well, let's just commit to it. Just do it. Right. This is own it, own it for what it is and make it the best we can make it. So I would say if it's call to action to sign up for the newsletter, you want to convince them before, like the call to action shouldn't be the deciding factor. It's like, I do I or do I not? If they're not finding value in it, they're not clicking. If they're finding value in what you have uh, promoted before the call to action, then the call to action won't matter, right? It's all about that value prop. So it's all stuff you've probably heard before, but um, hopefully I answered the question as you yeah, were hoping absolutely. to Absolutely. <laughs> and I think also that's why you see, you know, the the subscribe to newsletter inside your content. So as they're reading a blog post that interests them, have the call to action there, right? So 
yep. so that they're finding it when they're when they're in the middle of getting value from you from them. Um, I have a couple questions actually. So you talked about um, the SMS MMS uh, text campaigns and that sort of thing. Now, knowing our audience, which is probably, uh, agency owners, I could see them being interested in, in OmniSend for you know one of two ways: one for their agency, but also if they're if they're a WooCommerce or e-commerce site builders, right? If they're building e-commerce sites for customers, being able to offer this kind of service as part of their marketing um, offering is, is hugely powerful. And, and having the knowledge and, and the resources to show the value of this kind of service is great. So I can, it's really valuable for those, those members of our audience for sure. Now, about the MMS and SMS campaigns, what have you seen when asking for phone numbers on forms, would you recommend making it required as like the, the number one call to action or just an option? Do people typically fill it out when it's there? What kind of information is there on that? Typically what we find is that people do, uh, like people are excited about it and you will probably get a surprising number more than you thought you would of signups opting into it. Uh, as always, because it is a growing channel, I think if we we look back two years from now on this presentation, I think SMS will probably be double where it is now. Uh, we're certainly trending that way. I would not make it required, right? Make it optional. Let people, if they don't want to be in it, it's the same with email. If they don't want to be in the sign up, all right, give them an X out button. Uh, so make it optional, but I think you'll be surprised with the actual adoption for consumers there. You know, again, you, you make sure that you're not going to send them, you know, thousand messages a week or whatever, pretty typical basic things, but have the consent down there, let them opt in, have the country code, you know, so they can opt in based on the country. So you can comply with can spam or, or uh, uh, European regulations or whatever it might be, but keep it optional, roll it out there. And if people have the option, they don't have to jump into it. If they want to jump into it, they can get into it. But I think you will be surprised by how many people uh, want that. And obviously that's going to be age driven a little bit, but uh, you know, I always, here's the thing I tell people, I go, you know, are you get, are you either going to receive or send a text message today? And I've never come across someone that's like, nope, won't happen, right? Texting is just part of, it's like social media, right? It's just part of life nowadays. But, you know, we rag on Gen Z, which is shown to increase their email usage over the next few, few years. We rag on millennials. Luckily, I don't know, maybe not luckily, because I'm getting older, you know, I'm Gen X. But like I text every day, it's just what I do. You know, it's just a natural way of communication. So um, I think as people start to get into relevance, it's just one of those things that we're, we're heading there. We're heading that way. Yeah, I believe it too. And we talked a little bit about it in the, the happiness hour call last week um, and when Lindsay and um, the Johns were, <laughs> were on that call. Um, and it's true, you know, you, you think, when you think of like texting text marketing campaigns you think oh maybe you think like oh it's a little icky or something but then i think of the ones i've received and i i always open them and occasionally i'm like oh there's just there's a sale like i'm gonna go check out the website and yeah it's I, well it's funny because i think the one thing right now where people like they just might be disgusted with text messaging is you know if you're at least in the u.s you know we're we're close to an election and i'm getting texts all the time from political yeah. campaigns telling me like how my city's burning down and how the other person's lying and right, it's going back and forth and people can look at that and you're just like, this will never work as a marketing channel, right? But you're somewhat jaded because you're in the moment of this election season, which is obviously a furious one. Uh, but I, I will say this too, right? We are, you're gonna see this blow up at the holiday season. So I talked about the volume of SMS messages sent from that Q2 stats report. I pulled some numbers from just the beginning of September for something else and just look at an SMS. So if you think about this, September 1st to September 22nd this year, we had 98% of the volume of SMS messages sent already in that 22 days than the entire Q2. So you can think wow. people are not only, you know, they're not only opting into it, but retailers are starting to like hammer down a little bit more now, knowing that the holiday season is, you know, for the most part, about a week away from really kicking off here. So, uh, you know, the adoption's coming and you think about the sheer number of SMS messages you're sending on, I mean, we're talking about millions in a quarter. Uh, you know, it's not a light number to, to kind of, you know, sneeze at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, Robert in the chat says Uber Eats gets him every week with a, a coupon to his favorite barbecue restaurant. So <laughs> even if you don't like it, it works, right? 
<laughs> so, so Robert, I'd be interested to see where you live and what that restaurant is called. So in case anyone else is listening, <laughs> they know what's going on. Um, one more question that came from the chat is, does Omnisend have any kind of agency reseller partner options? Uh, so we do. I would, um, uh, you could check out, uh, shameless plug, but if you just check out omnisend.com slash partners, you can kind of get through the gist of kind of what we have that we can offer to partners. And um, we have, uh, I don't want to get into the details here, but we also have a, uh, uh, like an influencer program as well. So if you refer business over Omnisend, you obviously get a, a commission on that as well. So, uh, you know, so check out the partner site and check out the influencer uh, things there. And if you want to just explore it, if you sign up to be a partner and you want to engage in conversation, it, it's a super quick, like half a page form, a couple pieces of information. So I want to reach out and then you can talk about, you know, the, the fit and what type of uh, reseller options and things like that are available that might work for you. Wonderful. Um, that's perfect. Well, we are five minutes or three minutes over. So um, we'll wrap things up. I don't think we have any more questions coming in. Uh, Greg, thank you so much. Uh, this has been so valuable and I'm, I'm really excited to um, share this with folks who maybe weren't able to attend today to follow up with the recording and let everyone know all the great things we learned with you today. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, th for that. Thank you for having me, Emily. Great. All right. Thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you all at the next webinar. Have a great day.